We well, welcome everyone to our Friday lecture, which is jointly hosted by the Australian Centre for Architectural History, Urban and Cultural Heritage, or ACAHUCH as it's more commonly known, um, which is jointly hosted by Critical and Curatorial Practices and Design. And it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Albina Yanova, who's joining us from the University of Manchester. My name is Alan Perth and I'm Director of the Melbourne School of Design. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land in which we gather which may be multiple lands given the location of all of you listening in this evening. I pay my respect to elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians who may be present. Now I'm just going to give a quick introduction. Albi Albina Yanaba is Professor of Architectural Theory and Director of the Manchester Architecture Research Group, MARG, at the Manchester Urban Institute. She's been a visiting professor at Princeton School of Architecture, Parsons New School, and the Polytechnico de Torino. She held the prestigious Elisa Meitner Visiting Chair in Architecture at the University of Lund in Sweden from 2017 to 2019. Now trained as an anthropologist, Albina's research is intrinsically transdisciplinary and crosses the boundaries of science studies, cognitive, cognitive anthropology, architectural theory, and political philosophy. She is the author of several books, including The Making of a Building by Peter Lang, publishing made by the Office for Metropolitan Architecture and Ethnography of Design, Mapping Controversies in Architecture, Routledge 2012, and Five Ways to Make Architecture Political, An Introduction to the Politics of Design Practice, Bloomsbury 2017, and The New Architecture of Science, Learning from Graffini, World Scientific Publishing, which will be 2020. And that's co-authored with Sir Kostya Novoslov, a Nobel Laureate in Physics. She's also the editor with Alejandro Zairo Paolo of what is Cosmopolitical Design, um, Routledge 2015. Now tonight's talk explores Albina's forthcoming book, Crafting History, Archiving and the Quest for Architectural Legacy. And some questions posed by the book include what constitutes an archive and architecture, what forms does it take, what Epistemology does it perform and what kind of craft is archiving? And based on ethnographic observation of the Canadian Centre for Architecture, with interviews with a range of practitioners, including Alvaro Cesar and Peter Eisenman, Albina traces archiving through the daily work and care of all its participants, scrutinising their var variable ontology, scale and politics. Then Eva addresses the strate strategies practising architects employ to envisage an archive-based future and tells a story about how architectural collections are crafted so as to form the epistemological basis of architectural history. Now, the book is published by Cornell University Press and is due for release in November this year. So it's my huge pleasure to welcome Albina. Thank you, Alan. Thank you for having me. So the title of my lecture is Crafting History, uh, which is the title of the forthcoming book, which you, you have just introduced. Archives, uh, and I understand this is an interest um, that your students share, uh, the interest in archives and archiving. Archives are, are often evoke a musty place full of drawers uh, and uh, filing cabinets and shelves and it is either understood, the archive is under, either understood as a place containing records, objects, the archive as a house, as an institution, or it is just a collection of such materials from which history uh, emerges, like the sand from old books, or archive as a source. In both these forms, uh, the archive is not just an inert repository of artifacts of historical value, but is an active discursive system, a semantic machine that produces historical meaning. This dual nature of archives uh, has been the object of many studies from contemporary historians, philosophers, and art scholars during the past two decades, I would say yet it somehow escaped the attention of architectural scholars. So this study is motivated uh, by a number of recent developments uh, in the social sciences and the arts dating back to the 1990s. 
First, the archival fever, a term coined by Jacques Derrida in the 90s, um, uh, the, the archival fever in the arts with Derrida and also the writings of Paul Ricoeur as key protagonists of rethinking uh, the role of archiving as a tool of memory. This debate was in the 90s. Uh, the um, term mal d'archive, archival fever, was coined by Derrida in 1994. Uh, and by mal d'archive, he understands the desire to remember that is founded on the drive to distraction, the fear of death. Uh, a huge debate in philosophy which infiltrates the arts and the field of contemporary art, in particular with the advent of archival arts. Second, in anthropology at the same time, in the 90s, we witnessed the emergence of the trend of archival ethnography or an archival term in the field could be witnessed. Uh, the precise expression archival ethnography comes from the writings of Marshall Sachlins, and in particular his book, Historical Ethnography from 1992. Uh, and the term points to a historical research technique that aims at adapting ethnography uh, to account for the lived experiences from the past. Third, in the field of archival science, analysis of what it means uh, to be an archivist or of architecture tends uh, to come from the archivists themselves. So the, this body of knowledge emerges as a recollection uh, and also categorization of archival practices. Uh, however, in the mid uh, of the 90s, again, we witness an empirical turn in the field of archival science uh, and all these developments happen uh, somehow simultaneously and open up venues for exploring architectural archiving. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, is, uh, we also witness a very specific moment in architectural practice. That's the moment when the computer uh, enters architectural practices and radically transforms the way we design. Uh, the paper drawing becomes very precious, archives pile up and big firms begin appointing archivists and record managers. We witness the first traces of archival fever in architectural practice. Uh, Peter Eisenman recalls, and I quote an interview, people were telling me, why aren't you signing your drawings? Archival institutions will not take my drawings unless I sign them. So I eventually ended up signing, uh, but I never signed drawings at the start. I was not conscious. So that kind of consciousness was not there before the 90s, and it emerged with uh, the radical changes in architectural practice triggered by uh, the computer. So there's certainly a contrast to be drawn with the impulsive way art, anthropology, and history scholars fell under the contagious influence of the archival fever during the past two or three decades. In architectural studies, uh, there's still a noticeable silence, I would say, on the archival uh, front. Somehow, the archival fever did not manage to infect uh, the field of architectural studies uh, as much as it did other fields starting from the mid 90s. Uh, some recent uh, studies of, um, in history of architecture should be mentioned, however, uh, as they are exception. Um, some uh, recent uh, studies uh, have shown uh, more, albeit implicit, awareness of archival uh, formation. Uh, for instance, historians started to pay more attention uh, to uh, the limitations of archive and started discussing more openly uh, the limitations and the constructions of archives. Uh, the specific relationship between the document and the historian, uh, the role that archives plays in the methodology of, uh, of uh, historical writing was more explicitly uh, discussed in a, a reflective, in a reflexive way. Uh, nevertheless, none of these studies uh, explicitly address uh, archiving and architectural archives. Uh, interestingly, uh, scholars only notice the archive when it troubles them. The archive only becomes an object of study when an architect is effaced 
uh, from uh, official historiography, or a facet of an architectural personality is overlooked, or in situations of major lagunas or accidental destruction of archives, of economic crisis, of course, of striking contrast between abundant and poor sources, or the daunting threat that someone else will write that history. So when, when it serves the historian, the archive is invisible, it's mute, it's unchallenged, it's just a footnote. But when it troubles the historian, when it troubles architectural scholars, it resurfaces and it interferes epistemologically. It becomes visible. Addressing this gap in architectural scholarship, my uh, ambition is to shift the attention to the realities of archive making. How do we make archives? How we construct archives? Uh, and the aim is to explore the specific mechanisms of archival production by tracing how architectural objects become archival. And I look both at the material and the epistemic dimensions of this process, tracing how, uh, tracing the becoming archival of architectural objects and also scrutinizing the way archiving matters for practicing architects. It's the connection between designing and archiving that is interesting for me. The, the, the connection between uh, making archives uh, and, and, uh, um, and uh, mobilizing those archives in the practice of designers. Uh, so it is important to understand uh, first to what extent and how architectural archives reflect the nature of design as a collective, heterogeneous, and social process. Second, how situated and local practices of arranging, cataloging, caretaking, and preserving happen to produce larger structuring effects in an archive. Effects that resonate with greater epistemological anxieties in the discipline and the profession. So embarking in an anthropological study of uh, knowledge production in architecture, I ask, what constitutes an architectural archive? What are the tools, the documentary techniques and experimental tactics uh, needed for the production of archives? How is the dialogue with current architectural practices nurturing this production? At the level of the met methodology, I use uh, ethnographic observation, a number of in-depth interviews, most of them, them conducted as part of the ethnographic uh, observation. So I trace the practices of archivists, uh, catalogers, conservators, museum technicians, uh, and uh, this ethnographic observation is attentive to the places of knowledge uh, production uh, to the places of uh, knowledge production and care to objects, the attitudes, the forms of life, and to all those little and insignificant things which in their totality, little by little, step by step, allow us to understand what architectural archiving is. In other words, I advocate a type of architectural anthropology that pays attention to the production of architectural knowledge in its mundane, down-to-earth, practical and factual materiality. Inspired by the symmetrical anthropology of Bruno Latour, I pay equal attention to human participants in this process and non-humans such as objects, materials, instruments, mobilized in conservations, chemicals, and all sorts of uh, material agents in this process. Uh, the CCA, uh, my site of observation, is the Canadian Center of Architecture in Montreal, which is known to all architects uh, as uh, being one of the leading archival and curatorial institution in the world. Uh, it has an international mandate and it, uh, it uh, 
it uh, holds the uh, archival uh, archives of a number of uh, architects from the 20th century, and it still continues to collect contemporary architects uh, and their archives. It has a very special uh, collection of archives from the post-war period, and every architect uh, uh, knows this institution, um, especially research uh, active architects. Um, as they rely uh, both on uh, the archives to conduct research, but also follow uh, the um, uh, events uh, they conduct, exhibits, publications, a number of cultural events, which very often are agenda setting. They set a very specific discourse, uh, contemporary discourse on architecture, and uh, as such, the CCA plays an important cultural, uh, uh, cultural role in the field of architectural uh, scholarship. So my interest in the CCA at the start was drawn by the fact that they had a number of projects related to my work and uh, I, uh, in 2015, uh, they invited me for a talk and I had the first visit of the boards uh, there. But it's not the visible CCA that I'm interested in. It's not the visible uh, side of the institution or what you see on, on, on this picture, the, uh, uh, a spectacular building and a number of interesting public events uh, they stage but it's the invisible uh, CCA. And that's, ver that's the uh, very first um, uh, site I visit from the invisible uh, CCA. This is the vote, this is, uh, these are the votes, and this is uh, the, the chief curator, Giovanna Borazzi, at the time, now she's the director of the CCA, and um, a group of other curators. Looking at a very specific drawing, um, you can probably recognize the Chandiga um, drawings of Le Corbusier. This was my very first experience with um, uh, uh, archives and I will never forget this very first moment when looking at the Chandiga drawings, the original Chandiga drawing for the first time, I tried to uh, reach out to the drawing and touch it. At the moment my hand was approaching the drawing, I heard a very vocal and collective no. And this no was, um, uh, still resonates uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, my uh, uh, head. So this no uh, uh, is uh, uh, um, not a random uh, uh, no. It denotes uh, uh, on the one side the acute awareness of the importance of this archive. This means no, it's important, don't touch it. And at the same time, uh, it contains another undertone. It denotes the worry about the destruction and, and it shows attention to preservation. So it is precisely that balance between preservation and destruction uh, that defines an architectural institution. And I wanted to understand, understand these two undertones of the no, which contained these two conflicting, uh, um, uh, these two conflicting uh, messages uh, and the balance that the CCA provides. Uh, I also, uh, this, this very first uh, uh, scene, in the archive also made me aware of the existence of a group of people, which I called Society of Friends of Architectural Objects, which uh, uh, speak on behalf of the object and are there to protect it, to take care of it, and to make it eloquent, to make it an object that speaks to researchers and publics. Uh, I, after the votes, I also visited many other hidden sites of architectural archiving, uh, the shipping area where the objects first arrive, and uh, Marie and Alexandre open the crates and they can smell the objects and they can try to detect from the very first moment of, ar of arrival, they can uh, detect uh, problems, uh, particular problems with the shipping uh, and they start uh, cataloging the objects, the votes, which we have seen the conservation lab where, con con very, uh, where trained conservators take care of objects, restore drawings, perform specific treatments on the objects um, and uh, of course using a number of um, special instruments like the microscope uh, that you see. 
Uh, and uh, uh, if uh, in uh, the gallery upstairs, where we can see the visible sites uh, of the CCA, uh, the objects are confident, eloquent, uh, and they're in perfect control of the environment, here in the sites of archiving, we witness objects that are constantly negotiating with the environment, uh, battling uncertainty, uh, begging for care. There, the speech uh, is interrupted, hesitant, uh, complemented by gestures, like the gesture of conservator David that you see here, uh, and also instruments. The, the contact to the object is mediated by uh, instruments. So while in the gallery, humans, usually curators or historians of architecture, talk on behalf of the objects in the sites of ar archiving, in the invisible hidden sites of archiving, objects uh, talk only through the trials, the equipment and the controversies and the scripts and the instruments of the friends of archival objects. Uh, to uh, illustrate the complexity of archiving, I will focus on one particular case, and uh, this is uh, the uh, archive of Alvaro Caesar, which uh, was recently acquired at the time, so it was in 2015, um, uh, and uh, in 2016, when I started my uh, observation at the CCA, uh, I have witnessed the very first boxes of uh, Alvaro Cesar's work arriving at uh, the CCA. Um, of course, to understand this process of archiving, I cannot just stay in the CCA and visit the different sites, both hidden and visible sites of archiving, uh, but I realized I had also to travel uh, to many other places in the world and in the case of Alvaro Cesar's archive, uh, this involved traveling to Porto uh, to talk to the archivist of uh, Alvaro Cesar in Porto, to the architect himself, and then back to Montreal. So I had to vi visit many other sites uh, and collect a number of voices uh, uh, of people and institutions who talk on behalf of the architectural objects and on behalf of the archive. So, uh, the particular case I'll be looking at is the rehousing of Caesar. Picture two scenes. The first scene, Porto, a large office at Rua do Alexio, uh, a man in his 80s, models, letters, uh, an archive, smoke, uh, his cigarettes, camel, his, he, he smokes camel, uh, this purse catches, catches all over the desk of the architects, ashes menacing the fragile paper, floating through the air like dust. This is Alvaro Cesar, his archive, his past piling up and ordered in his practice, in his possession. Scene two takes us to Montreal. Big boxes placed in the immaculately clean vault spaces, CCA archivist Adria wears gloves to manipulate some uh, drawings. Uh, she's taking the drawings out of the big box. A man in his 80s visiting, uh, visits the vault, pristine shiny floors, silence. The man is inspecting the boxes, a pack of cigarettes in his hands, yet a lack of smoke. This is Alvaro Cesar visiting the CCA. Uh, the archive has arrived in Montreal, but as soon as the archive arrives there, is not his archive any longer. The, uh, that's why he cannot smoke. Uh, it, uh, the archive has achieved an archival uh, standard, and uh, we can see a transformation, uh, both from an intellectual point of view and from a physical point of view. Uh, we have to wonder what happens to the archive between these two scenes as it travels from Porto to Montreal. Uh, and this route from office, from office, uh, from the practice to collection, to archive, has an effect on the materials themselves. 
and uh, both on the material and the cognitive uh, transformation of the archival objects, uh, which acquire a collection mode of existence. And I would like to focus on this specific trajectory. Um, as I mentioned, my ethnographic study started uh, over the summer of 2015, and I witnessed some of the, uh, the biggest parts of uh, Caesar's archive arriving from Porto. And these um, first boxes contained materials from the 1950s to uh, 2010. And, but what is in these boxes? So if you look at the left-hand side, all these big boxes with materials, all sorts of materials, what, how do we define an archive? What's in the boxes? Archive, um, archives document uh, the livings of an architect uh, that contain the multiplicity of working drawings um, uh, that um, the, the, the boxes usually contain a number of uh, different materials. Usually we have a multiplicity of working drawings, not one uh, drawing, one selected, uh, let's say initial or final uh, drawing, but multiplicity of working drawings um, that document the thinking process of the designers. At the same time, uh, also the boxes contain materials that document the social and the cultural um, process and context, different issues, social and cultural issues of architecture. Uh, the archive emerges as a broader entity. Uh, it's, uh, if we have to find a formula to describe it, it's a drawings plus, 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 plus. And we can uh, uh, include a lot of things in the plus. This could be books that have inspired the architect, uh, um, his library, paintings, correspondence, tools, sculptures, uh, paintbrushes, photographs, personal materials, uh, and we can continue the list. So it's drawings plus, plus, plus. The archive is therefore this entire inspirational and contextual apparatus that makes architecture possible, this kind of inspirational machine of architectural thinking. In Caesar's case, uh, we can see uh, boxes with uh, his personal uh, sketchbooks arriving, but also uh, boxes with drawings and many other uh, materials. And to put some order in uh, the archive, the material is organized in three series. In this particular case, in Caesar's case, we had three series that correspond to different type of activities of the architect. First, we had uh, have the projects that reflect the professional practice. Uh, second, we have the sketchbooks, which were very interestingly were kept separately from uh, the project. So they were kept in Caesar's house, uh, in um, his private house, whereas the uh, drawings and the projects were kept in as an archive in uh, the practice. Uh, and uh, third, uh, the third series contains materials that reflect Caesar's teaching uh, practice uh, and his teaching lecturing and publication. So we can see uh, that there's already at the start um, an organization of the material that is related to the different activities of uh, the architect. So uh, this material arrives uh, at uh, the CCA and a number of, archi of archivists start working on the CISER phone to make possible the rehousing of these materials in uh, the CCA. So to fully understand uh, archivists at work, um, we need to listen to a number of people, to a number of voices, uh, and their different accounts of the trajectory of archiving. We need to, I had to listen to the directors of the CCA, Mirko Zardini at the time and uh, Martin de Vlitter, uh, and they talked a lot about the negotiation process uh, and how they acquired the archive. Uh, Phyllis Lambert, the founder of the CCA, Giovanna Borazzi, the chief curator, and a number of archivists, Adrian Pamela, cataloging scissor on the Montreal site and Magda and Chiara uh, cataloging and working on the archive uh, in Porto, as well as Caesar himself. As you see from the very start, there's a multitude of actors, uh, there's a multitude of voices to be taken into account to understand this complex, tra complex trajectory of archiving. 
The key actor, however, in the whole process was the archivist Chiara Porcho, uh, who was completely unknown before I interviewed her back in 2018 when I visited the practice of uh, Alvaro Cesar in uh, Porto. And in what follows, I would like to tell you the story of Chiara and we'll have a close look at the practice, uh, at the practices of archiving uh, in uh, Chiara's uh, archive, in Chiara's office, uh, in the practice of uh, Cesar. Um, so uh, my intention also is to make Chiara visible, a completely unknown agent of history, because history will remember Caesar and uh, the key actors involved in this archiving process, but perhaps the name of Chiara uh, will never be uh, mentioned. I would like to give attention to her, I would like to make her visible, uh, and as her activity in archiving and organizing the archive of Caesar, her work is extremely important. So, the story of Chiara. Trained as an architect, um, Back in the 80s, uh, Chiara uh, started working with Caesar in the 80s on a number of different projects. Uh, and at the end of the 90s, there were a lot of important projects already in uh, the practice of Caesar, a number of influential projects. Uh, 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 such as the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Porto, the Chiado, and the Torren van, van Sisa. All these projects were in the office, paper piled up, mountains of paper, as Sisa said. Uh, as Sisa explains uh, when he talks about this moment in the 90s. Uh, and uh, Chiara, a young uh, architect, uh, suggested to put some order in the archives. She, in a way, she volunteered. Um, to become uh, an archivist, uh, putting some order in this material. Uh, she introduced an original order in the archive uh, that reflects as much as possible the order in which the documents were created, gathered and used uh, in the context of the firm. So it was extremely important for her as an archivist to know well the culture of the practice, to know well the projects and the way CISA works. Um, also the fact that she was trained as an architect uh, helped her in organizing uh, the project. Uh, the arrangement of the material uh, in a way closely mirrors Kara's knowledge of CISA's practice. Uh, so she started organizing uh, uh, the, the archive as if it were an architectural project, uh, she says, separating the drawings uh, from correspondence. So this is already a well-arranged archive. That's what you see on the picture. And this is on the ground floor of the Porto office of, um, of uh, Caesar. So this is the kingdom of Chiara. She is in charge of the ar archive down there on the ground floor. So the production of knowledge of the different phases of architectural project, uh, the profound knowledge uh, she had on uh, Caesar's architecture and on the different phases of architectural uh, projects uh, help her to develop a precise plan for the archival organization. With the years, uh, I uh, interviewed her in 2018, so she already had a long career as an archivist, and she is the key archivist of CISA. With the years, Kara learned where things stand in uh, the archive uh, she organized. On that shelf or, uh, on, or in that drawer. So she gained a very specific knowledge of where where to find things, where to locate uh, things. Uh, knowing where to locate uh, objects is a very specific archival uh, knowledge. It is true inserting, uh, inspecting, memorizing and organizing uh, as a repetitive series of operations that she acquired this very specific knowledge of where. It's not knowledge of, it's not knowledge about a particular project or a particular architectural uh, uh, feature. It's knowledge where. 
Uh, so the minute scale of knowing where is often compared to the grandiose uh, ambition of knowing everything, knowing all about Caesar, an oeuvre that crosses many different fields outside architecture, sculpture, painting, exhibitions, writing, fashion, he even designs um, glasses. Uh, it's uh, an enormous encyclopedic oeuvre. No one can know everything about Caesar, Chiara uh, argues, uh, but she knows exactly where to find the specific object. So archiving, as we see here, is about, is about knowing little, but knowing it well, and knowing where to find more. The uh, practice on the second floor is still very active. They have a lot of projects uh, which are active as we speak. Chiara, uh, Chiara is on the ground floor, Caesar is on the second floor. The life on the second floor of Caesar's practice is overflowing with surprises. So there's a constant connection between uh, the practice and the archive, uh, the second and the ground floor between designing and archiving. Um, so uh, a project travels from the second floor, from the practice to the ground floor, to Chiara, only when it's stopped or it's put on hold or is entirely completed. Uh, Caesar and Chiara communicate on a daily basis. Uh, we see Chiara preparing a drawing on the picture. She's preparing a drawing for Caesar. And he calls her many times uh, to discuss uh, about the drawing. Then uh, when I am on the second floor to talk about the design practice, uh, she joins the interview in the office and they, I can literally witness this constant connection between practice and archive. Uh, they are constantly communicating, Caesar and Kara constantly communicating as well. So uh, have a look at the materials that Caesar has just given to, to Chiara. Uh, it is not a selection. Uh, uh, it's uh, a bunch of things that were just on his uh, desk a few moments ago. Uh, and this uh, uh, contains a little bit of everything. Uh, and the message on the front page uh, reads from architect Caesar to Chiara. So Chiara knows what to do with this random collection of things, and she has to find a place for each document. Uh, because this constant dialogue with the practice, um, uh, uh, Kara knows everything about the ongoing project, and with time, Kara has cultivated a very specific skill to recognize uh, Caesar's handwriting, uh, and of course, uh, his style of drawing. Uh, in many different variations, but also in many different temporal variations. She can recognize his handwriting from the 60s and how it's different from his handwriting from the 70s, his uh, drawing style from the 50s and how it's different from the 60s and the 70s. So she has acquired this very specific uh, knowledge. Um, his collaborators, the collaborators of uh, Caesar, for instance, often try to mimic uh, Caesar, the way Caesar draws. And this very tiny differences between uh, Caesar's drawing and the collaborator who is imitating the way Caesar draws, because he's part of the same practice, these uh, barely detectable differences can be detected only by Chiara. Uh, Kara has gradually cultivated the skill to distinguish all these kind of uh, small differences in series of variations, in series of copies uh, and reiterations that are all kept in the office. So these hardly noticeable variances can also tell a lot about the hidden working dynamics and uh, the collaborative um, uh, relationships in an architectural practice. They tell us a lot about the culture of the practice as well. Uh, we can also uh, see different variations of these collaborative dynamics. For instance, uh, on some uh, drawings, uh, we can see uh, some drawings of collaborators, we can see Caesar's handwriting, his, his Caesar's handwriting over the drawings of the others, and we can immediately 
uh, interpret this as CISM must have looked at the um, drawings of the collaborators and must have provided some feedback on uh, these drawings. Uh, in another case, a sketch from a completely different project um, a completely different project can land on the drawings of another building and it bears traces um, of the ability of the architect to work on a number of dif different projects at the same time. Uh, and we can continue the list of collaborative dynamics which can be read, of working dynamics uh, that, that could be read through these many differences between uh, series um, uh, and variations of drawings that we find in the practice. Uh, so this, we can see that a drawing has many different layers uh, of information, um, many different signs on the surfaces of this drawing, which only the archivist can detect, uh, can interpret, uh, and uh, can analyze. So uh, Sarah's, uh, Sarah's work remains on the surface of the sign. She is like an Egyptologist trying to read a manuscript written with very uh, special Egyptian signs with hieroglyphs. Uh, drawings allowed reading this process uh, of both collaboration but also creative dynamics and trying to tell us uh, and the archivist uh, can reveal those dynamics and prepare the epistemological ground for researchers uh, for them to read and interpret the drawings. With the time, with time, Caesar also changed his way of uh, doing things. His drawing and his write, writing techniques evolved many times. Uh, his buildings also aged and needed inter the intervention of Caesar. So we are in a very complex time dynamics there. Buildings he designed in the 60s need him back, need him again. Uh, he has aged and transformed. The buildings have transformed the archivist and the archive has mutated as well. So we in a complex multi-temporal uh, dyna dynamic space of the archive. Um, just as Carey has developed those skills, she's developed other skills and the buildings have also changed. This, this is really the challenge of completing an archive uh, alongside an architect, uh, an architect who continues to design and work. And uh, Kara worked on organizing uh, the material and as she worked organizing the archive, the archive trained her too. Caesar very often comes uh, downstairs in the ground floor uh, to uh, learn from the archive. No one knows everything about the archive. Uh, the archive appears as this kind of autonomous agent, uh, which is also a source of agency and knowledge for all actors involved in the process. Caesar comes down, come downstairs to consult a project, to look at a specific, bo specific body of material, to learn uh, from it. Uh, this is uh, something I have seen also in other practices. For instance, an architect from the same generation, Peter Eisenman's practice in New York, uh, we can see lots of records are kept there, like files, correspondence, models, current projects, although the archive is not uh, organized as well as uh, CISA's archive. So CISA's archive is an exception of well-structured and well-organized archive. Uh, Eisenman's archive um, is a different uh, case, uh, but he explains when asked about the archive, he explains, uh, I quote, the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin, for instance, was built 10 years ago. He says, but we are still negotiating. Uh, there are some stones that have cracked and they need our attention, things like that. So these are the records that are, we are legally required to keep. Uh, the archive allows, uh, as we see, both Caesar and Eisenman to re-examine all projects and to intervene in uh, the buildings. Uh, it holds a library of things. It, uh, it's a major ed memoir for these practices and for the architects involved in uh, uh, the work. Uh, and it allows architects to reuse ideas and to intervene in the buildings. It allows the architect to um, also um, 
uh, it, uh, the archive also operates as a mediator, so to say, between uh, the buildings and the design uh, practice. And that is why the archive is important. It's not a passive repository of things, but it's constantly mobilized in the design uh, practice, uh, in designing. Designing and archiving connect all the time. So there's um, placing uh, projects in relation to others, organizing materials, uh, detecting differences between drawings and different variations of the same material, tracing connection. Chiara performs a skeletal epistemological structuring of the works that will eventually become imprinted in the classification scheme of the archive and will prepare the ground for the work of the researchers. Uh, so her work, work is never boring. It's always interesting and it's uh, cognitively important. By generating knowledge where, archivists uh, does lead to the production of knowledge about, the factual knowledge which the researchers uh, are in charge of. But archiving doesn't stop here. Archiving doesn't stop in portal when um, Chiara has organized perfectly the material and in the last few years also with the help of a younger archivist, Magda, who is also learning from uh, Chiara. To fully understand uh, the trajectory of the archive, we have to go back to Montreal. So going back to Montreal, um, the work continues. The boxes arrive at the CCA, these super well organized boxes by Chiara and Magda in Porto, um, have to be opened and the material have to be rehoused. Rehousing the material means taking it out, examining the folders very carefully to see whether the material is placed in non acidic folders, uh, whether there is any danger uh, about uh, for the materials from a conservation point of view, and then placing uh, the material in other boxes. That's what rehousing means. Rehousing is not simply about um, moving materials from acidic um, to uh, acid-free uh, folders and boxes, but also about establishing uh, new epistemological connections. So this cognitive work of the archivists continue. Uh, through physical displacement of material, new connections between projects uh, could be established and also new knowledge could be gained. So um, just have a look very quickly at the work of Adria this afternoon. Uh, I watch Adria working in the vault uh, and she is um, um, going through some material from the sketchbooks, then she's going back to her computer uh, with a huge Excel sheet to include information on the different materials she has expected on uh, the table. She's looking at the Bonjour Tristesse project uh, in, from Berlin and completing uh, the information in the, uh, on Excel, numbering and describing some materials. So 3D moves back and forth between the table where she can expect the material, inspect the materials and the computer screen with all the numbers and specific uh, descriptions through these moves Adria is able also to extract new knowledge. She found uh, 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 more information about some about the kindergarten and the, uh, which was part of the um, Bonjour Tristesse project, something that she didn't know. Then she places a note to reconnect the two buildings as part of the Bonjour Tristesse project and the work continues. She compiles this note of information. She places it back um, with the object, uh, the physical body of the object and then the information is also inserted as a sign on the computer screen. This just this very quick description gives you the flavor that this cognitive structuring uh, continues. 
the uh, epistemic work of the archivist, the archivist uh, continues. Uh, Adria can also ask questions um, because sometimes she cannot understand why a material is placed in a particular uh, folder. So uh, she can ask why is this material here, why is this document here, and if she cannot understand why, she takes the question back to Chiara. Uh, Chiara uh, explains, provides an answer, but if she is not able to answer that question, then the, the question will go back to architect Caesar. As we see this constant communication between Porto and Montreal, between the two sites of archiving continues. And the simple questions like this, of why is this document here, reveals both Chiara's reading of Caesar's archive, Caesar's work, uh, as well as Caesar's own perspective on how his work is to be archived, structured, and understood. So we are facing three interpretative maps here, three interpretative schemes, um, uh, uh, constantly in dialogue and sometimes overlapping and sometimes uh, mm, uh, not. Uh, through rehousing, Adria gains knowledge about Caesar, and his work process. Far from being dull, her work is uh, cognitively rich, leading towards the production of the CCA map of Caesar's font. And I will stop my uh, story about the archival work here. Uh, in uh, conclusion, we could say that far from idealizing the archive, archive with capital A, as an ultimate source of architectural knowledge or a supreme technology of architectural history, again, capital. Uh, what uh, I advocate here with this mundane stories of archiving, um, looking at the down to earth practices of archiving, uh, there are obviously no capital letters. So what I advocate here is a study of archiving as a process, archiving as a practice and uh, also um, attention to the politics of archive making. Archival materials are not simple aesthetic artifacts. In fact, we can never see archi archivists having a wow moment. Oh my God, it's Frank Lloyd Wright, or oh my God, it's Alvaro Cesar. This, there's always a suspension of the aesthetic judgment. Architecture objects never manifest themselves as aesthetic objects in archiving. Uh, they're rare, they're rather rare epistemic objects that speak on behalf of a practice, a period, or a movement. Archivists are the first to reach, to reach out to the finer ontological granularity of architecture objects in their journey to become archival. Yet archiving is never about a specific object, uh, but always about archiving architectural materials of a larger social and cognitive importance for the discipline. It is not simply about storing, uh, it is a way of extracting and correcting knowledge. We can see the, the knowledge is constantly corrected, even through the minute operations of the archivist at the level of the mm, ontological granularity of the object, at the level of the surface uh, of uh, the object. We can witness, witness a constant process of extracting and correcting knowledge so that the more refined understanding of architecture is produced. Archiving is a precondition uh, of architectural history. Therefore, more should be done to scrutinize what constitutes an archive today, what form it takes, and what systems of classification and epistemology it performs. More should be done to account how an archive becomes an epistemological basis of architectural scholarship and pedagogy. Following architectural objects as they become archival, we suddenly realize with surprise and total bewilderment how limited, complex, and unpredictable architectural objects could be and how circumstantial, contingent, and partial 
the production of architectural history is. Thank you. Thank you, Elvina. There's a virtual round of applause going on, I'm sure. <laughs> well, thanks very much. And um, so we're going to have a, an opportunity now to invite questions um, from the audience. I think, I mean, probably there's quite a number of people here. So, I mean, feel free to use the, the chat function. I'll try and keep an eye on it. Or if people want to um, even put up their um, participant's hand, maybe Theo could help me just to see who's got their hand up to ask questions. But I'll maybe just try and kick off, Albina. Um, and look, I think I'm curious to maybe go back to 2009, um, or the publication of Ethnography of a Practice, which is based on your experience in ONA, which was, I think, two, was it 2001 to 2003? Is that right? So that two years of, of you spending time in that practice, and I, I read a lovely kind of quote from you. We described it as you um, observing your tribe. Um, you described the, the practice as a, as a tribe. And I think what's interesting in that presentation is our conversation around Caesar. There's a such, such a focus on Caesar, obviously. Um, whereas when you talk about ONA, you talk about a practice. You don't talk about Kulhas necessarily, you talk about the practice. And I'm, I'm curious about this whole differentiation between practice on one hand and, and archive and a practice, the building on the other extreme, um, or the project, and you've obviously written the book, The Making of the Building, um, and there's the object itself, there's the, the artifact, the building, inhabited. So there's these kind of complex, it's just not all just about the process, um, and extract the knowledge from that process. It's also just trying to capture that notion of a practice and how that practice works. Now, in Caesar's case, he's obviously brought in an archivist who's provoking him and prompting him to think and act in a particular way. So that role of the archivist has probably changed the nature of his practice in some, some respects. But I just would, I'm, I'd like to hear just about that comparison between someone like Caesar and, some, and a practice like ONE um, um, and how, how, they, how they work. Thank you, Alan. That's that's a fantastic question. I um, in this in this project, I focus more on the practices of archivists and um, uh, the uh, conservators, uh, the register people, the technicians, the archivists in the CCA are my key characters. Uh, so uh, this would be the equivalent of the OMA collective production of architecture if we have to trace comparison. Uh, the, uh, the, in the OMA case is the young architects which are constantly there in dialogue with the models producing a building and the star architect comes uh, and goes from the practice or only represents the practice uh, in official discussions, the present, a presentation to a client, etc. Uh, here we have um, a number of archivists which are usually invisible, so that would be very comparable to the younger architects in the practice of uh, uh, OMA, uh, that their, their work is usually invisible, usually hidden on this kind of invisible sites of archiving. Their names are not known, very often not known, like uh, Kara's name, for instance, and there is a collective agency there to be described because that's what I tried to capture with the multi-sited nature of archiving between Porto and Montreal, and then in Montreal, many other sites where the archive is being organized and, and uh, there's a collective Active work on the archive. However, and you have noticed very, um, your, your, your comment is very precise, uh, in our, whatever we do uh, to describe the collective agency of a practice in um, the office of a star architect like OMA, uh, we can um, uh, we can, in a way, put on hold the star authorship, the star figure, and talk about the practices and the projects and the, the, the trajectory of those projects. But in archiving, 
uh, the name of the author, of the star architect, remains because at the end of the day, this is the archive of Caesar. It's labeled as archive of Caesar and it goes in architectural history as uh, the archive of Alvaro Caesar. Uh, so I also struggled with this um, tension between uh, the collective aspect of design making and then the single authorship or how we reduce collective uh, action to single authorship, especially when we have, uh, uh, when this has to go in architectural history in some kind of catalog of events and names, and then at the end we end up with um, reproducing the myth of the single creator, uh, just because uh, the archive will be labeled uh, the archive of Alvaro Caesar. If I were to spend two years in the office of uh, Caesar, perhaps I could have produced a very similar account like the account I have produced on OMA. Of course, designing in Caesar's practice is different. The process, the, 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 the rhythm of design, the material attachments of designers to other objects, perhaps not form models, but many other object sketches and drawings in this particular case is a very different one and I could have described Caesar, Caesar's practice at work uh, by producing um, um, a, a picture of the practice that overcomes entirely the myth of the single of the star architect of the single creator and showing the collective agency of uh, the practice. So this study is uh, different. Uh, I focus on archiving and uh, the key heroes of my story uh, are the archivists. So that's why it's not, it was not a story about Caesar, but it's a story about Cara uh, as the key actor here, as the actor I want to make visible because she and many other actors like her, like Adria, Pamela and the other archivists working on archiving and the collective agency of this this uh, people uh, contribute to uh, the production of archives and they make visible the work of Caesar's practice. Okay. Look, okay, I'm just going to go to some of the questions that are coming in um, and also just to remind people, I mean we have, this is a, a Zoom webinar so we can, you can actually ask questions. Um, Helene, I know you're quite keen to ask a question so do you want to just, rather than me reading it out, it might be easier just to just to ask Alvina. Oh, yep, absolutely, for sure. Otherwise, it becomes a little bit too verbose. Hi, Alvina, how are you going? Thanks for a really Hi. great lecture. I, I love hearing these stories. In fact, I might even reverse my question. I was going to ask about the difficulties of um, the archive once it becomes digital, given the inbuilt obsolescence of digital artifacts. Uh, but actually, I'm really more interested, as you probably know, in um, how you narrate the stories of these, uh, the caring labour, all the women that occupy the story of the archive here between Caesar's office and, um, and the CCA and, and the role of an ethics of care here. I wonder whether you could speak a bit more to that. Thank you, Ellen. Um, yeah, most of the the architect, the archivists I met, um, female. Um, only the digital archivists um, uh, were male, and I, um, in a way, noticed this difference. Also, thanks to thanks to you, Ellen, because you, in a way, uh, drew my attention to this kind of gender aspect of the work from the very start. I was much more interested in the materials in the. Uh, instrumental practices in the material culture of the archivists uh, and not that much of the in the human figures uh, but then little by little as uh, the work um, unfolded uh, the female presence and the work of care uh, became very Im important to unpack uh, and there's an important politics uh, of course political aspect of this um, of this uh, uh, work uh, to share. Uh, so my contribution in a way is to make the work of all these uh, participants and in this particular case, all women uh, visible because the work was um, either not understood or not noticeable or not acknowledged enough because as we, as I just uh, mentioned to the, in response to Alan's question, what we have at the end is this kind of one big name imprinted in the golden books of architecture actual history, uh, the boxes have the structure uh, and the archive has the structure organized according to those big names which are usually uh, 
big uh, male names. We have Eisenman and Caesar, uh, but what goes into practice and the very uh, specific work of archiving and, and, and designing and the connection between archiving and designing uh, is invisible and I wanted to make it visible and I wanted to give um, visibility uh, uh, to the work of um, the complex work and the important work of all these uh, women um, mobilized in the making, in the crafting of architectural uh, history, which is uh, my uh, contribution, but also the collective work of archiving. It's never one particular archivist, but it's the work of many different archivists and how it connects. Uh, it's never one architect designing in the practice, but it's this collective agency and um, it also has multi-temporal dynamics and it has multi-actorial dynamics and we need to acknowledge this complexity and describe it uh, so that we can understand uh, it better and prepare for um, uh, this politics of care for the, for the legacy, of, um, for architectural legacy in the future. Uh, in, uh, as far as the digital is concerned, of course, this is a completely different story. And uh, the digital object has a completely different life in the archive. It's much more complex. It has much more technological layers and, uh, and telling the story and, and sometimes a paper drawing uh, from the 17th century, for instance, uh, is much more durable than um, a digital object from the 90s, 1990s, yeah? Uh, uh, because um, file systems change, the computer system change, uh, uh, there's a number of legal layers, copyright issues, uh, and we don't know, archivists don't know how uh, this file will be read in 10 years, what will be, what will be the technological system uh, that will allow this object to be preserved, the file to be opened, and the image to be visible and read so that architectural researchers could have access to it. It's more a story of access and technological development rather than the Egyptology concept of an archivist reading the signs on the surface and the many different copies that are developed in uh, paper archiving. So this, there's a completely different ontological um, story to tell and, and therefore the existence of the digital object as an archival object uh, is uh, a very uh, different which makes it also more fragile because of the there's a knowledge forward there archivists have to think how to preserve a file in 20 years they have to speculate on the future so they go they don't go back in time like paper archivists like Chiara but they go forward and they try to see what happens in 20 years. There's all, always this span of 20 years of thinking. It's more knowledge forward that they need rather than a knowledge where and knowledge of uh, the past. Albina, there's a couple of questions come in. And Philip Goad and um, Theo's asked the question about architectural models. And I mean, again, back to OME, I mean, you, you talk about that. Um, a lot in your book about the importance of the full model in the context of their work. I mean, you couldn't present your work without it, really, in terms of trying to show that process of conceptual yeah. thinking. And Caesar's obviously using models a lot, as do a lot of practices. There's huge challenges there for archives to store them. But can you say a bit more about that, that whole process of the model? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, models, uh, uh, I have uh, looked at a number of cases in, in uh, the CCA, I was much more interested in the social life of the big scale models and I looked in particular at uh, Cedric Price's model, the Fund Palace uh, model, and also I looked at um, uh, the um, UN headquarter model, the OMA, which is a huge model, the size of a person, and which is extremely difficult to assemble. Uh, so I pays, paid more attention to the difficulties of assembling and putting a model together, which um, was produced um, which was produced, which, which is not meant to last. Yeah, and that's perhaps the comparison with OMA uh, models because in OMA we have experimental models, quickly produced foam models on the spur of the mo moment because architects need to play with ideas very quickly and experiment with things. So the model is a thinking tool, it's an experimental tool. And no one thinks about um, 
um, the life of this model, whether this model will stay, uh, will be uh, stored in an archive, will ever become an archive, or well, maybe never, because it's just a temporary uh, experimental uh, model and it will never go in history, in the big books of history. And when some of those models end up in the CCA as working models, of course, they create a lot of problems for conservators. They don't know what to do with, with models or just like they don't know what to do with sketches drawn on a napkin, yeah? Uh, because these are not uh, objects that are supposed to last and, and they cannot battle time in the same way as other objects. And that's why I focus more on the huge scale models, uh, which uh, were just presentational models that were supposed to um, present the concept of a, of a big uh, uh, project. Uh, in the two cases, in Cedric Price's case, uh, the, in the Fund Palace case, and in the um, uh, Universal Studios OMA huge model, there's a um, conceptual models of a project that never saw daylight. So we are not talking about real buildings, but a conceptual, big conceptual kind of creatures. The model is huge, gigantic. It, it, uh, it, it overwhelms entirely the creator, but it also uh, creates a lot of problems and difficulties in the conservation lab because conservators have to try to understand how the model was assembled at the very start. They, they do a lot of mistakes, they're not instructions for assembly, then after they, they struggle a number of days, they have to produce instructions for assembling the model. So this model, if it travels to other curatorial institutions and exhibits, for instance, the, the Fun Palace model traveled to Germany for an important exhibit, it travels together with the conservator and the set of instructions that are written and that accompany the model travels just like passports and papers accompany a human being uh, traveling um, uh, um, across uh, borders. Uh, so that kind of life of models was extremely important for me to account. Uh, and it's a very different, uh, of course, a very different uh, um, social life than the, ex they have a very different social life than the experimental models in a way. Models are also very often part of those boxes of things, boxes of wonders that, that we open when we look at an archive and they sometimes are not very well organized and preserved because not I think only 80% uh, or even 90% uh, of the boxes are open. Nobody knows what's in the other boxes because not every archive is well organized and structured. There are two types of archives, as uh, Mirko was saying, they're the well structured um, and organized archives, the sanitized archive, but also the messy archive that arise with all sorts of documents. And uh, sometimes in a box, you can find experimental models like the OMA models and paper drawings and other documents that go together. And you have to decipher like a, an archeologist of why all these um, documents are together, why all these objects are together in the same box. And you have to read, try to de decipher the relational dynamics of the box. Very often you also find in the messy boxes materials that are not supposed to be there. And if uh, the model you find, an experimental model you find in those boxes in, is in, in need of an urgent, um, urgent care, then this model travels back to the conservation lab and then uh, um, it, um, it is being restored or assembled, what, whatever the, the treatment uh, the model needs. Uh, and it becomes an object that is numbered. Other, otherwise, the archive is treated at the level of the boxes, at, at the level of the, in a way, this multiplicity is kept. It's the level of the box, not the, the level of the object. And it, the object becomes visible and numbered and it gains a reality only when it's taken out of the box numbered and then it becomes um, either part of exhibit or, uh, or goes to the conservation lab or other sites of archiving. It's interesting you mentioned price. I mean, I, I, my experience with the CCA, I mean, price actually had a coding system um, for all his projects, which I think is a fascinating one because he was obviously very good. You, you can assume that he was very conscious about archival practice or, you know, how someone would access the material. And I mean, I, I, another one of the questions about, you know, Caesar seems absolutely conscious of his own legacy via the archive. 
So it's maybe, you know, in, impacting on his behaviours. But I mean, one of the challenges we've got um, is that most practices probably aren't thinking about archival practice, um, mm. um, which is one of the huge challenges. Um, but it's interesting that CES are so engaged in that process. Um, and I'm curious, I mean, do, are you... Are you aware that it is changing his behaviours? Is it changing the way he's practising, the way he's working? Because of this awareness, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ab absolutely, yeah. Um, <clears throat> of course, he does not... Uh, he, he, he uses the archive on a daily basis, even for things um, that he remembers very well. So this dialogue is very important for him. So, for instance, he came... One time he came and uh, he um, was looking for a door handle he designed in 1978 for a particular building and then he could not remember the specific building but he remembered very well the design of the door handle so he literally took a paper and uh, did a drawing of the door handle gave the drawing to Kara and told her, go and find out this project. He did not remember, it was the 1978. Uh, then this drawing uh, then traveled with Kara. Kara had to, to find the specific way, uh, the specific project, and then the file with the, the materials, um, uh, then uh, when it was found, uh, Caesar could look at it, at the, all the detailed drawings, so he could then reproduce this very specific uh, detail. So the archive, uh, it's an extension of his mind, but it's an extension, extension of the collective um, practice of all architects working at the time, because he could not remember who worked on that project and even the name of the project. Um, uh, and if his hand remembers the specific design of the door handle, no one else in the practice could remember it. So it was just, they, they trusted the archive entirely. So the archive was there to complement this missing um, knowledge of, of, of the practice. Uh, and uh, the, uh, it's on the one hand, as you say, um, conscious um, um, thinking about the legacy and a conscious uh, construction of this legacy because some projects are thrown, some other projects uh, made more visible. So it's a very deliberate and careful uh, political construction of the legacy. Uh, the architect decides what projects he wants to be remembered uh, with and what kind of legacy uh, the archive will be crafting. But on the other hand, and I think it's very important, is that the archive constantly operates and participates in the ongoing projects uh, and helps architects to design, to maintain perhaps the same a style, the scissor style, um, to be maintained for future projects and then uh, allows also this kind of interventions in existing buildings. Uh, uh, so it's this kind of uh, uh, technical memory in a way. The archive is this technical memory which works on a daily basis, is, is mobilized on a daily basis by uh, the practice. And uh, this, the archive is this super brain as well because no one has uh, the knowledge about all the projects uh, and all the specific uh, design um, solutions that the practice has produced over the years. And I'll be a, Donald's asked a question here about, so he's asking about, you know, is it really true that the interest in the architectural archive takes off with the emergence of the digital? So he talk, he, Donald's making reference to the RIBA, which has you know, got a huge collection of works by Indigo Jones, um, um, you know, the Archive of Palladio. You've then got the British Museum and its architectural archives, the Sohn Museum um, and the archives of Sohn, including Sohn's archive of other architects. So, you know, Donald's asking about, you know, this kind of, kind of lineage of collecting um, and collections. But I think you mentioned at the outset of the talk about this notion of the 90s became this kind of trigger point for people signing drawings. Right, yeah, I, I think uh, Donald is right. There's a number of archives before the 90s as well. Uh, what I wanted to, fo I wanted to focus on this um, debate between fields and especially the focus on archiving and the archive, uh, many archival turns happening at the same time in the 90s, which is not 
uh, random moment, so to say, it's mid 90s, uh, which in architectural practice corresponds to the digital, to the advent of the digital and then uh, the way the computer is changing um, the, the way the computer is changing design practices. And because my interest is not in archives in general, but it's in archiving and how archiving connects to the practices of designing architects, serves designing. So how archiving and designing connect, but also inform each other and nourish each other. That's why 1990s uh, is an extremely important moment for me. And that's why I have uh, seen in these two practices, especially Eisenman and Caesar's practice, but but also other younger practices as well, uh, that in the 90s, because of the digital um, copies of drawings and, and, and drawings with the digital tools uh, that proliferate in the practice, uh, uh, this moment of archival fever uh, is much more visible in architectural practice. And in a way it creates, uh, that's what the practices were telling me in interviews, it created the need to start archiving. It made also the paper drawing precious, yeah? Uh, but also because of the exhibits and the public visibility of all projects, digital copies are, were required and it became important uh, to produce more and more digital copies. Uh, the, this, this also brought more awareness of the importance to organize the paper archive. So the digital and the paper had this important dynamics in the 90s because of these discussions. And, and uh, of course, on the philosophical front, we have this discussion on archival fever, a whole rethinking of the field uh, of arts, contemporary arts, digital arts, uh, and, and the, the advent of archival arts. So there's a lot going in adjacent fields. Uh, and of course, in architectural practice, but not, not that much in architectural scholarship. But uh, nevertheless, there's an emerging reflexivity there among historians and uh, that's why it was important for me to focus on that moment. Uh, but I agree they're well-organized archives far before the 1990s. One of the things I was quite interested in, I mean, um, I'm sure once I get a copy of the book, I'll find this out, but I, I was curious about you interviewing Peter Einzelman um, in relation to archives. You know, Einzelman's really kind of interesting, I think, in the context of... of the drawing in particular, because I mean, he's very, he talks often about architecture and building not being the same. Um, and the, the drawing really for him is a manifesto, you know, it really is that critique and speculation. So he's someone who often kind of denounces practice and the building. Um, um, and I was just wondering through that interview process, what his perception of art, I mean, I could imagine the archive to him is maybe an important thing. Um, more important than actually the building. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Uh, um, I just want to clarify that Eisenman is not interesting uh, for me because he's Eisenman, but because he's the first architect uh, whose archive was collected at the CCA. So it was not a random choice. The first body of work of an architect organizes an archive, uh, uh, international architect, because they had lots of Canadian architects before, um, uh, was Eisenman's archive in the 70s. They acquired uh, the archive and then the last body of work that they have collected, they collected more afterwards, but um, the, the, the last I have seen arriving at the CCA was, was the Caesar archive and that's why I wanted to to have this moment the beginning and uh, the kind of the, the first and the latest archive acquired uh, go and visit the practices to trace this connection between archive and design archive making in design practices as connected to the cognitive uh, activities of architects at work, the experimental and epistemic thinking of architects and uh, archive uh, as, as it arrives in uh, an archival institution. So I just wanted to uh, capture these two dimensions of archives. Uh, and uh, instead of looking at many different cases, I had the first archive and the latest archive and these are two different practices and as you say with a completely different understanding of what an archive is for instance Eisenman said that he doesn't have an archive he indeed doesn't have a well-organized archive it's more of a kind of messy collection of things and boxes which 
uh, just uh, dispersed in, in uh, the office, um, but at the same time he has collections of other objects, like he has co a collection of letters uh, from Colin Rowe and many other collections lots of things collected from REM as well. There was a connection also, uh, as related to the opposition journal and to many other uh, collections of uh, articles and, and documents and letters, which are part of this kind of inspirational machine, intellectual machine of um, architectural thinking. Uh, and well, a collection is a different thing than an archive. There was not a consciously organized archive and therefore a conscious structuring of its legacy. But but we should not forget that uh, most of the projects were already acquired by the CCA and well organized there. So perhaps that's why. Where CISA was on his own in his country, there was no similar institution like the CCA in Portugal. He tried to find a home for his archive in Portugal, but it was not possible. And then he ended up donating the archive to the CCA, of course, when he was invited uh, to do so. And, and that's another debate, of course, because the archive traveled out of the country. He was, there was a big polemic, even like a, a controversy. He was called traitor, you're giving your archive to the CCA, uh, the archive is not staying in uh, Porto. Then they had to find a, an agreement uh, and they distributed the archive uh, between three institutions, the Gulbenkian Foundation, um, uh, and uh, uh, this Lisbon, the third one, I don't remember, the one Lisbon, one Porto institution and Montreal. Uh, and they kept some of the most important projects related to Portugal uh, in uh, Porto and Lisbon and the international project in uh, Montreal as a kind of compromise. Don was just asked about Hedrick. I mean, the CCA was... I think Don was asking the question, was Hedrick not before Einzeman in terms of the collection? No. Not as a, uh, as some drawings, yes, but not as a body of work, not as an organized archive. And look, I'm just very conscious of time now, but um, maybe just one last question before we, we let you go. Um, I'm curious, a couple of years ago, there was rumors that the, um, the, the OMA collection was going to the, um, the V&A in London. There was definitely conversations going on about it. And I was just curious about whether you had any insights into that collection and where it might be traveling. <laughs> well, well, I mean, no, I didn't it, was, it was quite an obvious, they were really clearly thinking about, um, you know, all the body of work as a collection. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it still stayed with the Nye, uh, and there were debates on that front as well because it had uh, Nye had a much more kind of national mandate of existence, much more related to Dutch architects. Um, but um, uh, yeah, that's that's a that's a debate on its own. Yeah, look, I've just Monica's just asked one last, we'll squeeze this in as one last question, and I think this probably extends a conversation we had last night about the museum in the future. Um, but Monica's asking, what, in your opinion, what's your opinion about exposing the process of archiving, shipping, conservation, lab storage to public view? Should it be kept hidden or is exposing the back of house an opportunity for activation and recognition? Mm. And this is a conversation we had last night, yeah. Mm. I think it's excellent. It's an excellent idea. Yeah, because that, that's an entirely hidden world. Yeah, I have learned a lot also by looking at uh, the practices of museum technicians or the register people, the register people who open the boxes and they, they can immediately see if the object has traveled from Mumbai or from New York and, uh, and this kind of uh, uh, trajectory of the object, but also uh, what happens to the object, the different climates, uh, and how it damages or not the object, and how it how um, curators, technicians prepare the object for a different life, the material and the social life and integrity of the object as well. So all these kind of sides of the process should be made visible in a way um, so that we can better understand. Um, this work, both the material, uh, technical, 
but also epistemic complexity of the work of technicians, archivists, catalogers the ca the, that, that take care of the objects or that the objects can arrive to us as architectural scholars and curators in uh, a structured and, and eloquent way and then the object could indeed um, help us uh, to tell a story about architectural history uh, or architects and movements uh, that and in curatorial terms also to communicate the story to larger audiences we don't want dilapidated objects objects that are falling apart and that struggle with their environment but that struggle has to be made visible as well i agree that's an important story to tell it was one of the nice, I mean, the Biennale, um, I'm trying to remember, 2012, I think it might have been the Swiss Pavilion, when they brought the Price Archive to, uh, to Venice and it became a performative. Uh, you, could, you could ask to see certain aspects of the archive and someone would wheel, wheel it out. It was, quite, it was one of the nicest ones I'd experienced. Yeah. Well, look, I think I'm yeah. just trying to say we've run a bit over time. Yeah. Yeah, that uh, just the final thing to say in relationship to Monica's uh, question. What's interesting uh, to say is not just to make the work visible, but also to make uh, this um, dialogue between all these experts of archiving, catalogers, technicians, curators, uh, conservators, how they um, dialogue, how they communicate with the objects to treat them and to uh, make them all elegant because they learn constantly from the object from the material surface of the object sometimes. So I have conserva conservators who tell me, I don't even look at the front of the object, of the image, I look at the back of the object. So I can recognize the object by the back. They look at the corners, the hinges, the surface, the materiality of the object. So they learn uh, more about um, uh, the object uh, through this kind of material dialogue with uh, the object, which is a knowledge that could be then brought back uh, to um, the, the knowledge, uh, um, the factual knowledge of architecture. This can enrich the knowledge about architecture. Uh, so the knowledge uh, uh, of ontological fragility and granularity of objects could uh, enrich the knowledge about architecture. So to say that's why the story is important to tell. All right, well, I think we'll just, it's a good point to end on. Um, and just to say on behalf of the faculty, a huge thank you for taking time out to, to talk to us. I'm watching with great fascination. I think, you know, we're just about to swap places, Melbourne and the UK. Um, it's very unfortunate watching you. I think you're about to go into another lockdown. Um, um, if Glasgow's anything to go by um, and the spike in numbers, then yeah. Um, so thank you very much. Um, just a reminder for everyone that's listening in, next Thursday night, we have um, Dr. Bettina Schlofhaufer um, from Austria, who's going to be giving us a talk on the Growing House, um, the competition from 1931. Um, which is relevant to some of the work we've been doing in critical and curatorial practices. Um, so it's a great opportunity to see the original competition documents, um, which became a, a display village in Berlin in 1932. And there's a, a great deal of evidence that the growing house had an impact over here in Australia through some of the work of the immigrant um, architects. So a huge thank you for everyone for listening in. Um, and Albina, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all your questions. Thank you. Great. All right. Good night.